We pray that, Lord, that you'll help us in these days, Lord, where so much is going on in our world, our nation. We pray that, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom, that you give us protection and guidance. We pray that, Lord, that you'll be our strength in our weakness. And we pray, God, also, Lord, just as all of these things are going on in the world, we pray for revival and for salvation. We pray tonight as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 8, a very powerful reminder, Lord, of how you desire to bless your people, Lord, your people that walk with you, the blessings of walking with God, even in, in days of great turmoil and days of great evil. So, Lord, we, we come before you and we draw close to you and we pray that we have an ear to hear, Lord, what you're speaking to each and every single one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible, he turns me to our 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. There's so much going on in the world, and I hope to share with you this Sunday concerning uh, a prophecy update. Um, and that's pretty much looking at when world events align with Scripture, and there's so much going on in our world right now. And these are really volatile times, um, days where God has spoken in times past, and we are living in that generation where Israel is, uh, the nation of Israel is back in the land, the land itself is established. Uh, we find things really moving fast forward into Ezekiel 38 of the enemies of Israel surrounding. We find things happening with the Jewish people, with the rebuilding of the temple. We find natural disasters happening, not only all over the world, seismic activity, but just here this week and the increase of, of disasters that continue to happen. We're now dealing with pestilence uh, on an international scale. And there's, there's a lot to, to really take in because is, is Jesus has told us to watch and also to pray. Watch means to pay attention to what is going on and to what is happening and pray, most importantly, that we are where we need to be with God in these days. Because the world and the world systems are not going to save a man or a person. The only thing that's going to help us through these days is having a, a really solid walk with Jesus Christ in our lives. 1 Samuel chapter 8 is a very powerful reminder because it contrasts the nation of when the people weren't walking with God and tonight when they begin to return to the Lord, but then they falter again. And the title of today's uh, message is, When the Next Generation Does Not Know the True King. When the Next Generation does not know the true king. I want to backtrack just a little bit, uh, just to give us a uh, just a, a peek back at 1 Samuel chapter 7. But in 1 Samuel chapter 7, 20 years has gone by, and during that 20 years, Samuel has grown from a uh, from a young boy into a, a an established man as both a prophet, judge, and priest of the nation of Israel. And during those 20 years, the nation of Israel has been under the cruel bondage of the Philistines. Instead of being under the Lord and being a theocracy, they compromised in their lives, they compromised in their walk. And any time you compromise, you're always going to end up in enemy territory. You're going to end up under the enemy's rule. And they little by little began to walk away from God to the point where they had one foot, in a sense, in the church and one foot in the world. They were playing, you know, even though they were, in a sense, going into the temple, when they left the temple, they were engaged in the world. As we were reading that they were worshiping the gods of nature. They were playing around sexually and immorally in the world. They were putting a high degree on money and materialism. And these gods that are listed back at this time are known as Baal and Ashtoreth and Mammon were the three uh, central gods of the Philistines. And over those 20 years, you know, they accumulated these little idols, you know, just representing of where their heart was. And, and I think that there's a lot of people today, even in the church, that have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. 
they come here, they hear the word of God, but then when they leave the church, they go back and they live, they live their life in the world. And it's a divided heart, and, and people who live such a divided lifestyle really go through a, a lot of spiritual warfare, a lot of attacks in their lives. We find looking in 1 Samuel chapter 7, over those 20 uh, years, the nation of Israel lost every spiritual battle. Think about that. As their enemies were there, so much more powerful. God, God's power and presence not fully there with the people. And the enemy just had a field day with the families, with the young people. At the end of a 20-year period, we find that the nation began to lament. And one of the things that, you know, for a person who is in a sense backslidden or a person who has gone and walked away from the Lord, there comes a, a period of time where, even like the prodigal son, where you find yourself in the world and you begin to take account of your life and really consider where you are and where you're headed. And we find here that the nation of Israel began to lament. I also believe that it's also the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit continues to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. You know, I can remember when I came to salvation, you know, very aware of my sin, very aware of the righteousness of God, and very aware that I wasn't going to heaven of God's judgment. And then hearing the cry of God for God, you know, for me to give my heart to the Lord that God wanted to forgive, that God wanted to help me to live right, and God wanted me to go to heaven and understanding what the gospel of Jesus Christ was all about, that God so loved, uh, that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we find there in 1 Samuel 7 that the nation began to lament. And it's a very healthy thing in our life when we begin to lament. Wherever we're at tonight, if we're walking strong with the Lord, great. But if we're not, then it is a, it is a very healthy thing spiritually to really take account. When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a good place to be, to be in poverty before God because the Lord does want to make us rich in Him. And we find as they lamented that there was a barrenness of soul. And Samuel, at that time, was in tune with what the nation was going through. He was in tune with the heart of the people. And he called the nation at that point to repentance. He called them to turn from the world and to turn to God. And we find that repentance wasn't just words of just saying, oh, I'm sorry. But repentance was really a spiritual action in their lives. It means that they threw out all of the sin and all of the trash. They took an inventory of their lives. They got rid of all of the worldly things in their lives. And they said, you know what? We're going to follow Jehovah God in our lives. I think that's one of the most important decisions today in every single person's life is that you lament in a sense. You take a spiritual inventory and you make sure that God is on the throne room of your heart and you throw out all of the trash, the spiritual trash that is in your life that you really think about what you're watching, what you're listening to, that you think about who you're hanging out with and the places that you're going, you think about how you're living, and that you really seek to live a life in your life that is pleasing to God, that you're conscious of God all the time in your life, that you know that God is right there watching every single thing in our life. Sometimes we think, well, people didn't see, but you know what God saw? And then we experience, we want to experience the conviction of God's Spirit. We find that the nation of Israel was being moved, and they went to a place, uh, Samuel called them to a place called Mitzpah. Mitzpah was a place where they really began to nationally seek God. And as the nation went to Mitzpah, we find that the Philistines heard what was going on, and Satan is never, ever happy when you make a strong decision for God in your life, you can expect spiritual warfare. You can expect him to put up a front. But you can also expect that God is going to squash whatever the enemy is going to do to try to derail what he has ahead for your life. We find as soon as they went to Mitzvah, the, the Philistines heard this and they saddled up and they went to stop the nation of Israel. They came in full battle array. And we find there in 1 Samuel something really neat that happens 
Because if you remember in the previous battle, when they were in trouble, they called for the ark of God, but not for the God of the ark. And in 1 Samuel chapter 7, when the Philistines are coming for battle, they call on the God of the ark. They call for Jehovah God. They tell Samuel, you know what, Samuel, intercede, seek the Lord for us. And Samuel begins to pray and to seek the Lord, and we find there this incredible scene that he sacrifices a lamb in the battle. And we looked at the whole foreshadowing of that's incredible, of a, of a type of Christ. As the lamb is sacrificed before the battle, and God totally wipes out the Philistines. When we looked at the Hebrew and all of the things, even in history, that happened in that battle, that God would deal powerfully with the Philistines. He would respond by leveling their army, driving them back out of Israel's territory. And the offense was so great that the Philistines did not dare to enter back into that territory during that time. The next time we will find battle with them will be um, with Saul at some point, but we also really find the next major battle will happen when David comes there against Goliath. And as we end at 1 Samuel chapter 7, um, we find that the ministry of Samuel, interesting, is he continued as a circuit judge, that he went around the southern parts of Israel. And the duty of the judge, a judge really differed from a king, where a king established a government and controlled the life of the people. The duty of the judge was to go and was to teach the word of God, was to help people in their struggles he also brought judgment between in situations where they needed the counsel of God. And so the judge was a very powerful person in a sense where they taught the word of God, they helped people in their decisions for the word of God, and they always pointed people to the Lord and not to man. That was the duty of the judge. Samuel had three roles that God gave to him. We find that he's a priest for the spiritual intercession of representing God to the people and representing the people to God. He was a prophet in that he foretold and foretold the word of God. And he was also judge where he brought the counsel of God there to the people. Let's look here in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 1. It says, It came to pass when Samuel was old. Doesn't time fly? We just read the previous pages and he's like 30 years old and now it says he's old. A lot of time went by. What we find out here in this chapter moving forward is, is Samuel is married. He has sons that are grown up at this point. It's, it's life has flown by. He's been a faithful judge on behalf of the nation of Israel. And I want to remind you of the title again, When the Next Generation Does Not Know the True King. I want you to kind of be have that in your mind as we go through the study. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, or Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. After Israel repented, much time has gone by. Samuel has continued as a judge, and a good chunk of time has gone by. God says that Samuel here is old. He still has a lot of mileage left on him, even though he's older. He is now concerned about, which we should be as we get older, is the next generation prepared? Is there a next generation in your family that is prepared? If you went home to be with the Lord, what happened? What would happen to your household and to your kids? That's a big question. What would happen to the church? Is the next generation prepared at home? Because if they are, then there's a good chance they're also prepared for the work of the ministry. This question, which I'm proposing right now, was on the heart of Samuel. Samuel realizes that he's at the end of his time. His time is short, as Paul the Apostle said also. The time of his departure was at hand, and he's passing the baton, Paul is, to a young Timothy. And here Samuel is looking to whom he's going to pass the baton to. And it says that he has two sons. 
His sons have incredible names. Joel means the Lord is my God. And Abijah means God is my father. And if you think of the life of Samuel, of how he grew up and how he was raised, those two names were really his experience with God is what he named his kids. We find that Joseph did the same thing. Joseph, in naming Ephraim and Manasseh, they were named after the experiences he had with God in his life. Incredible names. He appoints his sons. Look at the next verses. They were judges in Beersheba. Very significant biblical uh, territory there where God had done some incredible work in Beersheba and the lives of, of the forefathers. Verse 3, tragic in light of the topic of this message. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. How sad. How tragic. And here, as well-meaning as Samuel is, as every parent, I hope, would be, he wanted to see his own kids continue the work of the ministry. I would hope that every parent, you know what, I, I, I hate to say this, I think there's very few parents today that are really concerned about the spiritual lives of their kids. They want to make sure they have an education and they have money and they have everything else and then Jesus is somewhere on the bottom. And let me tell you something, all those things are not going to matter if Jesus is not on top, if God is not number one, because they won't know how to handle all the other things in their lives. There's no question that Samuel's boys were blessed. They were blessed, but they did not walk in his ways. They were caught up in the ways of the world. And Samuel here is well-meaning. He wants his, his kids to continue in the work of the ministry, but they didn't have a heart for God. And his decision was a poor one. And as we look at ministry, it's important to understand that the ministry is not a job. It's not like you own the company and now you pass a, the business on to your kids. The ministry doesn't belong to us. The ministry belongs to God. It is God's church. It is not the appointment of man. The ministry is a call of God. It is his church. He's the head of the church. He's the one who makes the decisions. He's the one who calls and anoints and appoints a person to the work of the ministry. It is his. A need never constitutes a calling when it comes to the work of God. In serving the Lord, there are spiritual qualifications. In Exodus chapter 18, Acts chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we don't have time to go through all of those. That would be a, a, mess, a series of messages. But I do want to look at Exodus 18 very quickly. If you would turn there. And in Exodus chapter 18, when they were deciding on the leaders of Israel, Exodus 18 verse 21 there are qualifications and qualities of those who should be serving the Lord. Moreover, it says you shall select from the people, number one is able men. Able here doesn't mean that they were just physically able to work. It means that they were able to carry out the work of God. They were able, they were tactful. They were able to handle the things of God. And the next thing we find is such as fear God. They understood who God is and who they were. They were men of truth, which meant that they were men of the word of God. They were men in communion with God. They were men who were in their private life and spending time with God. It showed in their public life. They were men of truth. They hated covetousness. Notice here, covetousness means is they, didn't, they weren't interested in the things of the world. Where we find here the sons of Samuel were covetous. They were accepting bribes. They were giving perverted justice. And they, these guys here in Exodus chapter 18 and place such 
over them to be rulers of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and rulers of ten, and let them judge the people at all times. They were to handle the word of God. They were to bring the word of God. They were to help the people with the word of God. And then there was a chain of command, as we see. I just wanted, if you continue to study these areas, which you should, Exodus 18, Acts chapter 6, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, it gives you a real good, both Old and New Testament, you'll find that they're both in line. Many times, churches today can be well-meaning in appointing people to ministry, but some of the greatest mistakes can happen in the ministry when someone is appointed, but they're not called by God. We say, oh, they're, you know, they're an expert. Perhaps they are, they are in construction and, they, and you want them to build a project. Or they're a manager of a company. Or they're, they're highly educated by the world. And, and by the world standards, you say, wow, look, look at how good they are. They are even financially successful. But the question is, is are they saved? The question is, is do they first meet what we just read in Exodus chapter 18? Are they men and women who are able with God? Are they men and women who are living out truth? Are they men and women of integrity in their lives? Are they men and women who love the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, or their strength, and their light shines wherever they go? Are they men and women who come to the prayer meeting? Are they men and women who desire the will of God in their ministry, in their family, in their churches more than anything else? Servants of God, both men and women, must have a deep and sincere walk with God. And it doesn't matter what you do in the church, whether you clean a bathroom, whether you work in the children's ministry, whether you're an usher, whether you're an administrator, whether you're in worship, whether you're the pastor, it doesn't matter. What matters is the most important thing is your walk with God, period. No matter what you do for the Lord, it's a calling. Because we find in Acts chapter 6 that those who are waiting on tables there for widows, God would then use them as we find with Stephen, the evangelist, and Philip. And some of the greatest capacities went on to be the founders of the churches and they started out doing some of the smallest works. But we find firstly that they were men of biblical proportion. That they met the spiritual qualifications. And if you want God to use your life in the ministry, you know what? Give the Lord your heart. Give the Lord your life. Spend time with God every day. Let the Lord, you know what, Lord? If you're searching for someone, here am I. Use my life. I think one of the great dangers today is if you're living a double-sided life and people see that you're living a double-sided life is it brings the disgrace to Jesus Christ in your life. You go to church and you say, hey, I'm a Christian. And then on your social media, you're putting all types of sexual things on there, inappropriate things. Think about that. Are you putting pictures and things? Because what you are in public, listen, also needs to be what you are in private. You can't be two different people. The Bible says you can't be double-minded because you'll be unstable in all your ways. We want to be 100% for Christ all the time. Here in trying to understand what happened here to Samuel, you know, as I, as I look at Samuel's heart and you look at Samuel's life, I also for a moment wanted to look at the childhood of Samuel. And in growing up, Samuel did not have the benefit of seeing a spiritually healthy family. We know as a young child, maybe four years old, he went to be with Eli. And Eli was the current priest. He had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And Eli was a poor spiritual mentor to his children. He watched Eli was a compromiser with his children. He let them do whatever they want. We find that Eli was not a disciplinarian. He let whatever happened just fly. He had no control. Eli appointed he didn't think about the calling of God and just appointed his sons who should have never been in ministry into the work of the ministry. 
And he watched Eli establish his two corrupt sons in the ministry, and it was a disaster. And under their service, they took advantage of the people. They dishonored and misrepresented God. The Ark of the Covenant got captured, and God would ultimately remove all three of them. And this is the role model that Samuel had. It's a bit understandable. What Samuel should have done before even considering of who is going to serve in the ministry is the first thing is pray. God, whom do you want over your ministry? Lord, we need people here. Jesus says when he, in, when he was moved with compassion, I think it's in Matthew chapter 9, at the end it says as he looked at the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. What are the next words? Pray. Pray that God will raise up and bring up those who can labor in the harvest. Pray. Our world is in great trouble because we are at a time period right now. Not only are we reading 1 Samuel chapter 8, but we're living 1 Samuel chapter 8 right now. Because we're living in a world in a time today where there's a next generation that does not know the true king. That does not know the Lord. We're living in such a time. What does it mean to mentor the next generation? You know what? I want to encourage parents today, and I want to encourage those of you here that work with youth. The most powerful thing today, if you're a parent, a grandparent, if you're working with young people, is live for Christ. Be your message. Live for Jesus Christ in your life. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they will glorify your Father in heaven. When they see you living and walking with Christ in your life, that you are showing them who Jesus is. I think people get a a mixed message when we're not living for Christ, but we're telling them about Christ, and people are like confused. Mentor the next generation. By living for Christ. Mentor the next generation. Listen, if you're married, by showing your kids today what it means to be a godly husband, a godly mother, a godly father. Let them see what a godly father and mother and husband and wife is in the home. Let them see the good times. Let them see how you work through the hard times. Let them see what you do in success and let them see what you do in failure. Live out the life of Christ in your marriage because we have so many kids today that get into relationships and they have absolutely zero clue and what it means to be a man of God in a relationship and what it means to be a woman of God in a relationship. This generation today has no clue. They don't know how to treat each other. They don't know how to put God first. People want to do their own agendas and figure out their own things and make their own plans and schemes, and you know what? It comes to nothing. And if I can encourage the younger generation today, is, is mentor, be mentored by people that are living for Christ in marriages that are living for Christ and honor God and be the person that God has for you to be, and God will take care of everything else. It's so important today for us to be mentoring the next generation. I want us all to really think about, are we really preparing our kids to be the next husbands and wives for the Lord? To be the next fathers and mothers? To be the next pastors and missionaries and teachers and worship leaders? Or are we raising a generation today that does not know the true king? Because I'm going to tell you, as we're going to see what's happening in this world right now, is this world is totally set up because it's going to look for a leader. That's what we're going to find here in this chapter. It's going to look for a leader. It's going to look for a king. A king that's going to appease and compromise and be religious. And that king that is going to come, the next king is going to come, is going to be the Antichrist. And he'll be followed by Jesus Christ. 
And here in this book, we find as the nation of Israel is in the same place, the same time, we want a worldly king. And they end up with Saul. But after him, we find is going to be David, who will be a godly king. So here is Samuel is getting on in years. He's concerned about who will continue to lead as judges. And in verse 4, here's, here's, talk about a confused message that Samuel brings. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Ramah is his hometown. This is his house. And they said to him, look, you're old. What a nice thing to say. <laughs> look, you're an old man. Nobody wants to hear that, right? Look, you are old, and this you definitely don't want to hear, and your sons do not walk in your ways. I couldn't think of anything worse to hear. It means the next generation is not ready. Your sons are not following after you. And here's, here's the change. Make us a king to judge us like the rest of the world like all the nations. What is interesting here is that people respected Samuel, but they did not respect his sons. And notice his sons here did not walk in the, way, in the Lord's, in the ways of the Lord. And what is interesting is during this time, not only was Samuel aware that there was no leader on the horizon, but the people were aware that there was no leader on the horizon. This is heavy. Samuel's aware the people are aware, and the people are also aware that his sons are not it. They're not the ones who are going to be able to lead the nation. So they ask Samuel here, is, you know what? We want a king. They're not asking God for a king. They're asking Samuel to appoint a man. Appoint someone else. And the reason here is Samuel has appointed his sons, and they said, no, that's not quite it. Pick somebody else out here. And instead of the nation here returning to the Lord to a theocracy, they asked for an earthly king like the other nations, and that's known as a monarchy. And what is happening today as we look at our world today is that we find right now our world is totally set up. I re believe right now we're in a pause during this administration. Because when the torch changes, and I hope the day doesn't come where we, where we end up with a totally ungodly government, but we see just this terrible warfare going on in our country between good and evil. Look even what's happening in the Supreme Court justices right now with the battle for abortion. The threats that happen that had to be rebuked by those at the highest levels of government of threatening Judge Kavanaugh and those who support life. And they're saying, if you choose not to murder the children, you better watch out. No, you want to know something? You better watch out because you're dealing with God's kids. They don't even know what they're saying when you think about that. But we find here that our world is going to start to cry out for a worldly king. We're, we are so in position for this. Verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. Finally, now he's going to prayer. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. When we go back to the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 23, during the time of the Judges, I'm not sure you guys know of Gideon. There was, a there was a judge named Gideon. And the throne was offered to Gideon. And Gideon was a judge. And he says this in verse 23. I love this. I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. What a true heart of a judge. Not me, not my son, but the Lord will rule over you. Awesome. This was the heart of the judges. They were to point the people to God. You know, it's interesting today how we live in a world that so needs Christ. And yet the world rejects him. 
We have so many today struggling with life, depression, suicide. I got a call this week of a young person who visited our youth group years ago who committed suicide this past week in his 20s. People struggling in marriage, people rebellion, people struggling with drugs and alcohol, sexual adventures, people who are struggling with raising families, handling their money, and people trying in so many different ways, you know, to live it up and to find it of how they can work it out in the world. And as Christians, we watch so many people, so many family members. We listen to people's struggles and problems. It isn't interesting when someone comes and talks to you and you present the gospel of Jesus Christ and they look at your life and sometimes they say, man, you know, I see you've been married all these years and your family and, you know, I see what God has done in your life and, man, this is where I'm at in my life. And it's not that by any means that anybody's better. It's just that, you know what, it's who we're serving. I, I serve God. That's the only difference. And you're serving your flesh in the world. Hey, but if you turn to the Lord and you understand what Christ has done, what God has for you also. And it's amazing how people, you know, you go and you share and they say, no, 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 I, 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 don't, I, I don't want the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you're, you're perishing. I, I'm okay. I'm glad that that works for you. But it's, it's really, it's not for me. I'm so glad that you found something that makes you so happy. So, so does that mean you're happy being miserable? Are you happy being in the position that you're in your life right now? Don't you want God to work? And then you watch these people totally turn, go back into the world, go back to their drugs, their old life, go back to fighting, go back to just the trash and the filth. When God wants to give them a new life, a new start, eternal life. That's what he came for. And let me tell you something. It is so heartbreaking as a Christian to see people suffer and struggle and you share the gospel with them and they reject it and they ruin their lives. They ruin their future. Some of them will perish in their sins. And yet God was standing there saying, please let me into your life. Please let me into your heart. And listen, as Christians, we should have a broken heart for this world and for people. And if we're not, then you know what? There's something wrong with us. That should lead us to really pray for people and really compel people, the scripture says, to follow the Lord. And as Christians, you know what? We can take rejection very personally, just like Samuel did. We can. Sometimes people will not like you because of your faith. You'll lose friends because of your faith. Or you have people that think you're not cool or you're a goody two-shoes or you're not Miss Party person anymore. You know, and they just say, hey, you know what? Because we know what God has done for us and we want to see God help them because we love them. But the reality is, as many times as that people are not rejecting you, but they are rejecting the Lord. I think one of the hardest things that I went through in my life is 18 years of my family rejecting me for Christ. And at my mother's funeral, sharing the gospel and sharing my story with them. And then finally, at least they understood, and God began to heal. But 18 years of rejection... 18 years, my sons grew up, and they didn't see my kids grow up at all. They saw nothing. They thought they were just going to go to the funeral and be over and done with me, so they never have to see me again. And yet God had other plans. Why? Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just remember, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ in you. But be faithful to pray. And listen, don't let your heart become so hardened that you say the hell with them and I don't want anything to do with them. They did me wrong all these years and you focus on the past. Focus on today and what God desires to do in the future. And you know what? Let the blood of Christ deal with the past. Verse 8, according to all the works, God says here to Samuel, Samuel, don't take it so bad. I know you feel rejected, but in verse 8 he says, God says, 
Look at all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt. I brought them out of Egypt and they built a golden calf. Even to this day which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. They're rejecting. They're rejecting you because you're walking with me. And because you're walking with me, they, they reject both of you. Me and you. Now therefore heed their voice, listen to them, However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will rule over them. And it's important. It's important to warn people. It's important to talk about heaven and hell. It's important to talk about what happens when you take your last breath. It's important to talk about what God offers now in this life and in the life to come. It's important to talk about what Christ has done and if they reject him, the way, the truth, and the life of what awaits them. That Satan will keep them as a captive, just like the Philistines. It will continue to drive them all the way through until they're finished. And he tells Samuel, you know what, warn them. Tell them. Tell them what it will be like to be under a worldly, a worldly king. And if they had only served the Lord in him only, he would have defended, provided, honored, blessed. But they turned to man. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will rule over you. If you have a pen, underline this over and over. And you're going to get the drift. In verse 11, you see the words he will take? Underline he will take. Verse 13, what's the first three words? He will take. Verse 14, what's the first words? He will take. Verse 15. He will take. Verse 16. He will take. Verse 17. He will take. And you will be his servants. Six times over and over. He's going to take from you. He's going to take from you. He's going to take from you. He will take the first thing is your sons in an appointed time for his own chariots to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. You will not be living your life. You will be living your life for the king. You will be a captive, in a sense, of the king. Verse 13, he will, not only will he take your kids, your boys, for war, and for military, and for whatever he decides he wants. For his, And if you look at the life of Saul, it was about his ego. Imagine, imagine right now being a young person in the soldiers, a soldier in Iran under the Ayatollah. Think about it. Or being in Russia under Putin. Or being in China in the military or in the armies. Or being in these countries, listen, where you don't have freedom. It's not like here in the United States where you make a living and you have choices and you have freedom. When you go there, they tell you who you are and what you do and how much you make and where you live and what you, how you're going to spend the rest of your life. Entirely different. Verse 13, then he'll take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. You look at the world leaders today outside of the United States and any uh, country that is not a free country, which is most of them, and this is their life. He will take, verse 15, a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers. Well, they had taxes that were only 10%. It's not like here where they take half your paycheck. Verse 16, he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth, verse 17, of your sheep. Imagine that. And you will be his servants, verse 18, and you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you on that day. That is tragic. God says, you know what? You asked for it, you got it, and now you deal with it. Let me tell you something. Be careful what you ask for. Because I've learned a long time ago, and I'm still learning to this very day, a lot of times I say, God, I want this or I need this. And God is saying, no, you, you don't need this. 
You really shouldn't have this. And you, Lord, let me have this, let me have this. And he, give it, he gives it to you. And then you realize later on and say, Lord, I should have never, have. I should have. Can you take it back? The best thing to always pray is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, if you want me to have it. Lord, is this something that I should have in my life? Always desire what God wants for your life. Verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations. Huge mistake. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. What a warrior Saul was, huh? We're going to read the life of Saul of what happened when he went to battle. How sad they wanted to put their trust in man and not in the Lord. And what terrible consequences will come from that. You know, as we think of all the worldly leaders today, so many today that have made, you know, their own kingdoms, all of the battles and missiles and warfare, building man's kingdoms at the expense of the people. You know what we need to pray for today? We need to pray, and this is my prayer for world leaders, that they love and care for the people. And they do what's right by the people. When you read the atrocities that are happening throughout the world, the inhumanity, when you look at what's going on in Syria and the Middle East and Iran and China and all these places, and you see the struggles that people are going through, the hardships, the refugees, even right now, people trying to get in from Mexico into the United States, it's because they're unhappy and they're looking for freedom. How many in the womb have lost their freedom today? I want you to think about that. That have no choice. And that's how we vote in America. Everybody can have freedom except babies that are in the womb. They don't have a choice. How many today are financially chained? How many today are spiritually robbed? Verse 21, And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, Heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. This was like, go back, and God is going to give you what you want. I want to close in just reading. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. Let's just read this together. Because as we've read in this chapter, what the earthly king will take, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14, this is what God says, I will give. You know what Jesus says as the king? I did not come to be served. You know, I, didn't, I came to serve, not to be served and to give my life a ransom. That's the true heart of a king, of a real godly king, a real man of God, a leader of the Lord. That they're coming to serve, not to be served. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, It shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will. This is what God will do, not take from you. Here's what he will do. He will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city and blessed you shall be in the country. Blessed shall be in the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground in the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessings on you in your storehouses and all that which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself just as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the lord and they shall be afraid of you or they shall respect you or have reverence 
And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain to your land in the season and to bless all the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above, only not beneath And if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I have commanded you to this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. God says, I will bless. If you read verses 15 through, we're not going to read it right now. Verses 15 through 67 tells you what will happen if you don't follow the Lord if you want to follow the enemy of what will happen in your life. How could you not want to follow what God says? It's a mind blower. And look what God has done in the land of Israel today. It's it's miraculous. And it's not because of the faithfulness of the nation of Israel, it's because of the faithfulness of God. Because he keeps his word. And because he loves his people, all people. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and for 1 Samuel chapter 8. We pray, God, tonight, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord. God, just such great concern in the days that we're living. And God, help us, Lord, to be a church, to be a families, to be a people, Lord, that will seek to prepare the next generation. We are in desperate need of a next generation that knows the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. A next generation that is not looking for a man, but that is looking for Christ. A next generation, Lord, that will be the next generation of godly singles and husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. The next generation, Lord, that will serve in the house of the Lord. The next generation that will work with all their heart, with integrity, an ethic in their professions, a next generation that will be a light in this dark world, a next generation that will have compassion and a broken heart for perishing lives, and a next generation that loves the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength, and loves their fellow man as their very own life. God, we pray for such a generation. And we pray that we would be mindful of these things. And Lord, like Paul the Apostle, that each of us would have a Timothy or an Esther to pass the baton to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's all stand.